Was it a great weekend this weekend, especially Saturday? So what did it get up to? 56. 56, 57? Yeah. So all the snow melted in my yard, all of it, just in time for, what is it, four to six inches? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> my wife goes, Ugh. and I said, look at your count, look at your watch. What does it say? It was, what month was it? <laughs> what month is this? <laughs> and you were lulled into a false sense of, just like me, we are all lulled in this false sense of, hey, it's going to be. Uh, yeah, but the rat told us. We only the have rat months. told us. That's right. Was it uh, Jimmy the Groundhog? <laughs> Jimmy the Groundhog didn't didn't see a shadow, right? So, yeah. Well, it's an El Nino year, but that means for moist weather. Okay. Um, so looking at the course calendar, just to sort of kind of put a pulse on where we're at. We are in week seven. Okay, so you should have done chapter seven and 7.5. Is that like the weirdest thing, seven and 7.5? They're trying to be cute, seven and a half. This is for the template. <clears throat> so next week, we just, we have an exam. Okay, so your midterm exam will be <clears throat> next week. And um, let's see. Yeah, so I, uh, what I did was I created a study guide for you. Okay, so I'll go through that. Um, also next week, there's no chapter assignment or anything like that. So um, probably a good idea to start working on the project. <coughs> and, um, you know, I'll, I'll show you the study guide, but you could start working on the, on the project. Um, all right, so let me go through. <coughs> well, I can do, do it over here. All right, so what I did was for week eight, <clears throat> I put up a midterm exam study guide. And I actually, I printed out the exam. I'll tell you a little bit about, you guys want to know what's on the exam? <clears throat> okay, so you're going to get 10 pages. Is it 10? Or? It is 10 pages. Yes, 10 pages. I left number 10 in there. Okay, you'll get 10 pages. And it's a 40 question test, okay? And they're in groups of five questions each, right? And preceding that is gonna be some sample code. So you'll get some HTML, like the first set of five questions is uh, just H, like an HTML. Well, no, that's not true. HTML and or PHP, okay? So there'll be some code. Maybe a form, an HTML form, and some code, or you know, split up in separate files or in one file. Okay, and then you'll have a set of five questions that are gonna. They'll ask you some questions based on the code. My advice to you is type this code in. This is an open book test, open computer. You can use all of your notes. You can use my web page, You know, my web lecture notes. You can use your book. And I want you to use Cloud9, okay? So I expect you to like run some of this stuff. This is how you ace this exam. Type the code in and run it. Because there might be some, some things that are wrong. Maybe some syntax errors. Maybe not, okay? <clears throat> there will be some questions on this exam about things I didn't ask you. What should you do? Panic. Should you panic? Go to php.net. Where else? <coughs> what? Google. Okay. To the Googles. Stack Overflow. Right. Okay. Most of everything you should be able to find on php.net. Use the documentation. Okay. So uh, I did put a link up to week nine. There is a question on the test about um, string management like explode and that is on the test so you could go and take a look uh, ahead in chapter nine in your book or in the lecture notes <clears throat> and it talks about that but if you see a function that is not um gee he didn't cover that i'm not going to answer that no no look it up okay because that's what you're going to be expected to do in the real world all right um so here's the uh here's a study guide right here Not everything listed here may be on the exam. Uh, 
I should have put a bullet saying <coughs> there might be some things that I didn't cover that are on the exam, okay? But I covered enough so you should know how to look it up. All right, so you'll be able to use your notes, Cloud9. You'll be given two hours to take the exam, okay? Now, what I can do, um, so let me ask you this now. Do you guys want to take the exam immediately when you show up and then just leave when you're done? Or do you want an hour, um, you know, beforehand? What's that? <laughs> to do what? To work on whatever or ask questions or whatever, okay? What? Yeah, generally speaking, I find that hour beforehand is a good idea. If you don't, if you don't want to, just come an hour late, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right, so if you have some stuff, like, you know, questions or anything like that, or it's a chance for you to, if you're working on something with another student here, so that's, that's the plan. The plan is to, um, you know, if everybody's here and everybody wants to start early, I'll go ahead and, and do that, okay? But I won't start until uh, either everybody's here and wants to start or uh, 6.30. <coughs> Does that sound good? You guys okay with that? No? You want to start early? You want to get the exam over with? Yeah, the bright side is that it should probably take you between an hour and an hour and a half to complete the exam. Okay? That's, that's my guess. You have the whole two hours to do it. <clears throat> um, any question, other questions about the exam? No? Okay. You don't have any Zena? No. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, so here's the study guide. It, so, for example, be able to describe different kinds of variables being used. Are they <coughs> scalar? Are they composite? Um, how does this HTML up here, I'm sorry, how does this HTML down here relate to the PHP script below it? Okay. Be able to describe each line of the following PHP script. What is an issue you may have with using extract over specifying which form elements? Okay. Understand different types of loops. Uh, describe how the array and the loop are working. There'll be questions about that. What are the two kinds of arrays that we have? <clears throat> You're about to ask a question, Kevin. Yeah, I was trying to phrase it so I don't sound like a complete imbecile. There's associative arrays and... No, not about that. Oh. Uh, I, I'm just trying to remember. I thought... How, okay, so you have a chunk of code, and then you have five questions underneath it. I thought you mentioned the questions were multiple choice. They are. Okay. You know, you're saying describe, and for, to me, describe is writing. Well, that basically you'll be asked a descriptive question, and then you'll be given an answer. Okay. Okay, to choose from. All right, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Right. It's all right. Uh, different <coughs> kinds of loops here. Uh, what else? Yeah, be able to describe the HTML form and its PHP counterpart, what variables are being passed. Okay. Know about the super global, post, and get. You're going to get some questions about some of the My, MySQL commands. Hey, go to W3 schools if you, <laughs> okay? In reality, you're going to be asked at, you know, at your place of employment <clears throat> to do something. And you have all of the resources available to you to look stuff up, okay? Why not have you do that in an exam situation, right? Okay. That's more realistic. Uh, understand what each of the MySQL commands is doing and what the output, uh, what output it might produce. Hey, might be a good idea to like maybe type some of these things in, right? Okay. <coughs> yeah. Understand what each of the PHP functions do, file functions. PHP file functions do. 
file exists. F open. You might have to look some of this stuff up. End the file. Okay. And some stuff on authentication. Session. We'll be talking about session variables tonight and sessions. So this will cover that material. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So if you can go through this, you should do just fine on the on the exam. All right. Okay, so that's week eight. And week nine, uh, I posted up here a little earlier than I um, have in the past. It's because this is a this will be on the test, Explode. So take a look at how Explode works. Okay. There's, um, and its counterpart, which is, where is it? Mm, there's explode and there's a link and implode explode and implode okay all right week seven anything else I wanted to say no okay so um, so here's what we're going to talk about tonight chapter seven and seven and a half so chapter seven de dealt with creating logins for web applications, okay? And we'll talk about the implications of logins and personal data, right? Um, what do we do with new users? How do we handle new users? Uh, cookies, sessions, working with both cookies and ses sessions. And then seven and a half was all about eliminating duplicate code by using templates or templating, as they called it. All right, so um, question about chapter seven. So I, did you guys make it through chapter seven? Show of hands. Okay, did you read most of it? Okay, um, who found it annoying? Yeah, what was annoying about it? <clears throat> Alan. hoping somebody would say that. Okay. Had to keep reworking the code. Okay. So first, they say, oh, let's just do basic authentication, right? And then they say, oh, that's not working really well. Let's just do cookies. And then they said, wait, people hate cookies. Let's do uh, sessions. Okay. And then they said, well, you know what? Let's do cookies and sessions, right? Was that pretty annoying? Yes, especially since Yeah, there's that too. Okay. Does everybody who agrees, okay, that that was pretty annoying? Okay. Okay, I found that annoying. All right. So, do you think this happens in real life? Yes. Dear God, yes. Okay. It works. <laughs> okay. Let's see. I had somebody in my other class who was saying, no, not with authentication. I pay. Fine, maybe not today, but in 2009, when this book was written, it actually was a real thing, okay? You could have started, started building a web application using one type of authentication, and they said, hey, let's do, you know, because co cookies had, were like the big thing, and then it's like people are going, well, they're not really secure, let's do this. That's a real world thing. When the half-life of technology gets shorter and shorter, sometimes you go, you know what? This isn't a good thing. You find out. We have to fix this. Or um, customer requirements. Do you think they change during the development process? Yes, all the time. And if you don't keep up on it, and if you say, no, nope, we got to stick with the standard waterfall model of development, and we're going to do what we said we were going to do at the beginning, how long do you think that company will be in business? So this is why, that's right. And this is why we created a <coughs> new development paradigm called Agile Development. Okay? And the whole idea behind Agile Development is to be agile. That means write as little code as possible to get the thing working. Okay? Only develop the features that you need to develop. Then iterate, show it to the customer. Is that what you want? Because then when the customer changes their mind, you could say, well, 
this is how much more time it's going to cost you. Or you know, you, you have this give and take. But everybody, everything is up front on what you, uh, yes? It's exactly what I asked for, but not what I wanted. That's right. Right. And that's a problem of not being in touch with your user. OK? Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, so that happens. So you know, I actually like that about the book is they're giving you a, it's not a super real world example, but they're actually walking you through exactly what, you know, this, this will happen, OK? So from that perspective, it's good for you to experience the frustration of having to rework code, OK? So consider that an educational opportunity for you. <laughs> and again, books, I, like I said, I, don't, I haven't found a perfect book yet, but it does the job. All right, um, so that was annoying about chapter seven. So creating logins for web applications involving personal data. So your book talks about, first thing is like, okay, let's go add uh, user login data. Okay, so here's something you wouldn't do. You wouldn't set out to design an application and say, halfway through, let's add user access. Now you kind of do that up front. Okay, so that is kind of stupid <laughs> right there. But you don't typically design a, I mean, you, do, you don't, okay? You, you could. Yeah. You are? Okay, it's kind of stupid, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's an increment. It's, well, it depends if you are doing a proof of concept saying, let's make sure this works, then we'll add user access. It could be something that was always in the plan. Okay, if it's always in the plan, let's get the feature out, make sure people like this feature, then it's not stupid. If you release it into the wild that way. Yep, this application starts with one user. I was just going to say, I've known some that were developed by one individual for their use. Yeah. And, that's, and other people saw and said, wow, this is great. You can't have more people doing this. Yeah. Now that, and that's, that's good. All right. So that actually, that's, that could be a, a legitimate reason. But that's because the purpose, it's a different application at this point. Okay. So, all right. Um, good point. All right, so if you want to modify your existing table, and you need to add a couple columns, username and password. So we use the alter table SQL command to do that. Here's the command for mismatch user um, table <coughs> in the mismatch database. And you'll notice we are adding a username, varchar32. OK, so we're allowing 32 characters. And we're setting the password to be varchar40. Hmm, that's interesting. OK. So um, let's talk about passwords. So your book talks about using SHA, secure hash algorithm. Do you think it's a good idea to put password, unencrypted passwords in a database? <laughs> do you think people sure, why not? do what's that? What's the worst that can happen? Yeah, what's the worst that can happen? It's like using root with no password like we're doing right now, right? OK. Um, not a good idea. If the, the server gets hacked for some reason, and somebody is able to get a hold of the database. Well, now you've got people's passwords and the, their username. Bad enough, you have their username. So, how many people do you, do you think? Nobody does this in this room, right? How many people do you think use the same username in different accounts over and over? Well, I do. Okay. How many people? <laughs> how many people use the same password? Okay, right. Now, as IT professionals, we should know better. We we may do it, and I actually do do it, <laughs> but uh, I should know better. Now, there are there are definitely tools out there like OnePass and things like that that will create <coughs> um, randomized, highly secure passwords for ourselves. Okay, that you can't even figure out, but um, you, then you have a master password that you get in to get it to get access to it. It's a little plug-in for all your browsers or whatever. They even got it working with iCloud now. <laughs> okay, Apple iCloud. All right, so we have this thing called SHA, Secure Hash Algorithm. I don't know why I capitalized L here. Algorithm. Uh, so um, this will hash our password. Now, SHA... I just looked this up, actually. Um, 
There are better ways to secure your password. I think this has been hacked. <laughs> it has. Okay, because it's SHA-1, which was hacked a long time ago, actually, which is nothing more than an MD5 checksum. But it the, here's the interesting thing is the um, brute force trying to hack into this is pretty difficult because it's... Um, it's, how can I illustrate this? The best way to describe this is it's an encryption mechanism akin to putting meat in a meat grinder. You can't ungrind the meat to get, at, you know, to figure out what the password is, okay? But in reality, even trying to brute force guess SHA passwords, if your um, IT policies are set correctly, you typically can't log into something more than six times or you get locked out by the firewall or whatever the Cisco privilege, um, um, you know, IT policy is. All right. And a nice log message usually gets sent to somebody. <laughs> hey, check the logs. An email goes out for security alert and check the logs. Okay. Um, so when the user enters their password, it needs to be inserted into the database using encryption. So, and, and again, we're using this sort of as an illustration to, uh, or an example for here, you want to encrypt passwords, okay? There are better ways to do it. I, um, you can search on how to do that. Uh, there's a mechanism where you add salt and, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Okay, so it's used to encrypt data inserted in the table using the secure hash algorithm. It creates 40 character hexadecimal encry encrypted string using a one-way encryption scheme. That's the meat grinder thing, okay? So 40 characters. Um, why 40 characters? 40 hexadecimal characters. What's hexadecimal? Does anybody know? And you guys, I know you know. What? Base 16. Okay, so we count in base 10 you know, zero through nine, and then we roll over again to zero, and now we're in the tens digits, then we roll to the hundreds digits, et cetera, et cetera. Base 16 is zero through nine, and then we need A, B, A C, through D, F, yeah. okay? So um, the interesting thing, SHA is 160-bit encryption code, okay? 160 bits, it's any password, whether it's Three characters, or 17 characters, or you know, numerics and numerical, alphanumerics, whatever it is, will always end up with 40 characters. So why they're asking you to create a var char of 40, I have no idea. I think it should be a char of 40 because it's always going to be 40. All right. So how do we get 160 bits out of that? Hexadecimal, hexadecimal, 16 bits, right? So that's two bytes. Okay. So two. Two bytes um, and 40. Uh, so let's see, two characters, that's 20. And then you multiply that by eight uh, bits is 160 bits, OK? All right. Here's how you verify the user's credential following a login. OK, so I connect to the database. Um, and I'm going to use, you guys remember this right here, my SQLI real escape string. Okay, I talked about that last week. So we're going to go ahead and sanitize database input. Um, and trim, we'll go ahead and trim all the white space off either side. Okay, so that's that'll, what you... That'll help break the comment. Yep, yep, that's correct. All right. So this is what you need to do. This is, this is one thing. The other thing you need to do when you insert is parameterize your insertions. Okay, so I get the username and I, and I get the password. And then I'm going to go ahead and select uh, user ID and username from the mismatch user, where username equals the username and password um, equals, I'm going to go ahead and grab the encrypted version. Okay, because I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to encrypt the input, okay, and then compare that with password, <clears throat> okay? So I'm grabbing the password because it's an encrypted value. I'm going to take the user password and encrypt it, and it should be equal. All right. So I go ahead and do that query, 
If I get one value, life is good, login is good. If I get two values, that's bad, because that means I have two of the same user named and password identical. And maybe it would be a good idea if I said that the user uh, name, not the password, but the user name is unique, okay? And enforce unique um, fields for, for the username. <clears throat> So that would be good, just an extra level of protection. All right, so let's take a look at a, um, as a, at a log in PHP. So we can use HTTP authentication to log in our users, all right? All right, so let's take a look at this, login.php. All right, well, I'll go with the top here. So starting at the top here, if, um, First, we're just going to check to see if PHP auth user is set. All right, so if it is not set or the um, password is not set, we'll go ahead and send the uh, basic authentication headers. And if they fail, we'll just say, sorry, you must enter a username and password to log in. And we could give them a, a sign up. You know, hey, if you're not registered, here, click on this link and go to the sign up page. All right, so we'll connect to the database, and let's say they enter all that stuff in. We'll go ahead and sanitize our username and our password. We'll go ahead and query for it from the database, and then we'll check to see if uh, we got one row back. If we did get one row back, awesome. I'll go ahead and set the user ID variable to the user ID and the username equal to the username which allows me to, ta to tailor this web application to each individual user, okay? Otherwise, sorry, you must enter a valid username and password to log in. Here's the link if you aren't a registered user to sign up, okay? And then uh, we can confirm the successful login <clears throat> right here. We'll be bait authenticating them again. Uh, we can, uh, and, and there we go, they're logged in. Your login, your username. All right. So I mentioned the um, MySQLI real escape string and trim here. What about signing up new users? So we need some code for signing up new users. Here's the sign up sheet for that. Let's take a look at the form down here. Okay, so we've got a form, um, <coughs> standard HTTP post. It's a self-referencing form. We have an entry for the username and we have an entry for the password and a, uh, another entry for a confirmation of that password. So password one and password two, or you can call it password and password confirm, whatever you wanna call it and then the submit button. Okay, so the user goes ahead and enters stuff in, they submit, and we check to see if the post variable is submitted, it, I'm sorry, if the submit button was um, depressed, then that will set, set that, great. Let's go grab the username, password one and password two, and we wanna validate all that. So we wanna make sure that, every, that all of those entries were filled in. They can't be empty. Oh, and by the way, it might be a good idea to validate if password one equals password two. All right, so do we do this? Is this a good place to do this on the server? Okay, so do it on the client. Should we still do it on the server? Absolutely. You absolutely should do this on the server. Okay? Um, but you want to have client-side code that checks it so you don't have to um, you know, send an HTTP request and tie up some bandwidth to do that, all right? You're, you're better off doing, you want to have this as a fail-safe, all right? But you don't have to have elaborate code that says, you forgot to fill in this password, or you, forget, you just want to have something that says, you need to fill in all the entries. Handle all of that individual stuff on the client side, all right? Okay, then it's, it's more responsive.
<clears throat> it, you know, you do want to validate all the entries, but again, you just like, if you fail to validate any of them, just send them back saying all of them got to be filled in. If you wrote your client side code correctly, then, you know, you could put that nice little red highlighting box in JavaScript or, you know, and send them back to the, uh, route them back. Um, okay. All right. So we check all that out. Then what we're going to do is we need to make sure that someone isn't already registered using this username. Good idea. So we'll go ahead and select from the mismatch user table where username equals this username. If we get zero rows back, all is right with the world. Otherwise, we just, we're just we going to have to say, hey, an account already exists. Pick another one. <laughs> OK? All right, so let's assume they don't get anything back. Great. Now we can go ahead and insert this user with the password encrypted in the database. And we'll go ahead and we add a join date. We'll just fill that in with now. Uh, and then we'll echo out to the user, your account, your new account is successfully created. You are now ready to log in and edit your profile. Awesome. So uh, this question came up earlier today. So when you're entering in your password over on the client side, is it hashed? No. How's that getting sent over? <coughs> Plain, unencrypted text. Okay, so when you go and log in or sign up for an account where you're going to enter in a password, what are you looking for in the upper left-hand corner of that URL? An HTTPS. Never, never, ever sign up for anything with just HTTP. Okay? Now, if you want to go to an HTTP site, okay, as long as it's like static, that's fine. If it's a static website, it's not a dynamic website, pretty darn safe. But really, there is no reason anybody should be developing non-secure websites. OK, so what does that S mean besides secure? What does it really mean? Yeah, why is it secure? It means that if the pages are being encrypted before they're sent back and forth. Okay, do you guys know what SSL is? Secure, secure socket, socket layer. Layers. Okay. So the secure socket layer will encrypt everything that's going over, OK? So if that's HTTPS, you're in good shape. All right, that said, should I hash that value before I send it over? Anyways, I don't know the answer to that question. I think not, OK? I think, I think if you're using SSL, if we can't rely on SSL, and, and here's the thing about SSL. They are always updating that to make sure that the, you know, if if they get word that that's getting hacked, they come they update the algorithm. Okay, they re re update it. So they're on something like Blowfish five or something right now. Can't remember what it is. SHA, not really a good thing to use. Okay, <clears throat> but it's on the server side. It's it's something. It's better than nothing. Okay. Oh, I guess that's it. Um, yep, that's it for the sign up. Cookies. Who likes cookies? I love chocolate chip cookies. Yeah, those are my favorite. Yeah, I love these things, especially when they just come out of the oven. So. Who eats 10 of them in a row? <laughs> Only when they come out, right when they come out of the oven, when they're so hot that they burn the roof of your mouth. You know what I'm talking about? OK. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. OK. <laughs> HTTP authentication persists data on the client, but you cannot delete it when you're done. OK, so tell me what you guys know about cookies. OK, not you guys. <laughs> All right. You guys, what, what do you know about cookies? So cookies are stored on, stored in my computer, meaning on the client. Yeah. Is that a good thing? 
Okay, if I'm a web developer and I have a good idea of what is secure, actually not necessarily. If I'm a web developer and I'm putting stuff on my server, do I know that it's secure? Well, I should know it's it security, is. right? You know but how secure it is. You don't necessarily know it's secure. But I don't, okay, if, I, if it's my company's website uh, and I know, like we physically house a server and I know what the policies are, then I know the security. I have control over that. I actually do. Even if I'm deploying out to Amazon Web Services, I have no business deploying anything as a web developer without first looking in to see what the security is. And that includes knowing what version of PHP. Are they running version 5.2? Well, I better not deploy up there because it's not very secure. Okay? Are they running 5.4? Okay, I'm okay with 5.4. 5.6, even better. All right? So, um, things like that. But, if anything's stored on the client, what kind of security should I assume? No. Not only that, what else should I assume? I, I should assume they're out to get me. Okay? All right. So, what else do can you guys tell me about cookies? So, when cookies first came out, when did they first come out? I can't even remember. That was back during the dark ages. It was. So I'm trying to think. Was, was it like 99? Or? I think it was even a little before that. It could have been 98, 99. Yeah, 97, 98 yeah, was when yeah, they were yeah. first out. Okay, and so but cookies were the greatest thing. More. Cookies were, um, but people had this aversion to cookies because people could track you. Okay, and they knew <laughs> what you were shopping for. Well, Nobody, I, I, I can tell you right now, nobody needs cookies to track what you're shopping for anymore, okay? Google and Facebook know everything about you, okay? Even if you're not on Facebook, they know everything about you, okay? So, uh, but that used to be a big thing. Oh, they're tracking you. Big Brother's tracking you kind of thing, all right? So, um, but if I, am a, if I am a web hacker, what can I do with cookies? So all I have to do is pull up uh, Google Developer, right? Do you do this sometimes? You look at cookies and the developer tools, and uh, and then I can just look at the uh, the super globals in there, right? I can look at all the session. I can't look at the session variables. I can look at the that, yeah. I cannot look at the session variables, but I um, maybe I can. I don't, I don't think I can look at the session variables. I can look at the cookies, but not the session variables. Okay. So the cookies are there, and I can change those cookies. I can change the value of those cookies, right? So if you are putting personal data up there, like a user ID, yeah, it's okay, maybe. Username, yeah, okay. Um, all sorts of other information, that's not good, okay? But there are good things about cookies. Cookies allow the persistence of small pieces of data on the client that have a time limit and can be deleted at will. Um, so who turns cookies off in their browser? One, two, three, four. Okay. All right. So um, I always turn cookies off in my browser. Always. I um, And then... I'll go to a site that requires cookies. Well, first off, I don't think, I think you can develop a website without using cookies at all, all right? But I'll, I'll may, maybe I'll talk about that in a little yeah, bit. The marketing people hate that. <laughs> there are other ways to store information. I'll get into that. Of course there are, but marketing <clears throat> people still hate it. <laughs> so uh, no, marketing, will, you'll still meet the demands of marketing. Okay. Um, So the components of a cookie are you get a name value pair <coughs> and you get an expiration date. So for example, um, I could have uh, a name which is the user ID. I could set it, the name is the user ID and I can give it a value of one and I could give it a time, what's called a time to live. It's an expiration date, okay? And it'll have an expiration date and time. So the date when the cookie expires and meets its demise. 
So a cookie will last as long as its set expiration date. If the cookie's expiration date is not set, it will last until the user dismisses the browser session. So it lasts as long as the session by default. Using cookies with PHP. All right, so we have this um, set cookie function. So that allows you to set the name and the value and the expiration of a cookie. Now, if you don't want to set the expiration, you can just give it two parameters right here. Okay, so I could say username is the name and then my, um, my name right here, maybe my user um, KE marks, whatever, that's the value. User ID and one. So we get at these by using the cookie super global. We can retrieve the values of the cookie. So when I say set cookie, that's going to go into the cookie cache of the client browser, okay? All right, so if I want to echo out once they're logged in, now I, I have that value, their username available in the cookie. Okay. Using cookies for login information means that you cannot use HTTP authorization header. All right, you have to write your own. That's okay. That's not a big deal. So let's take a look at a login script that uses cookies. All right. So let's go down to the bottom and we'll check, here's the form. So I have a form, got a login for, I'm sorry, for username and I got password and I've got to submit, right? And then it's, it's an HTTP post. Uh, I call myself, go, come back up here. And if the cookie is not set and the user posted, then we're gonna come in here and set up some cookies on the client. So I'll go and um, uh, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and sanitize the input, go ahead and get the username and the password from the form, sanitizing it. And I'm going to make sure that um, the username and password fields were both, and um, I'm going to validate them. Somebody entered in something for them. Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and look up the credentials in the database, right? Saw that. And hopefully I get one row of data. If I get one row of data, that's <coughs> great. Now I'm going to go ahead and grab from that row, I'm going to go ahead and fetch the user ID field and the username field in this case. I would say that you, well, we'll get to that when we talk about sessions. Okay. And um, I'll go ahead and set a cookie for the user ID and a cookie for the username. All right. And then, anybody seen this before? What's, what's going on here? This is called routing, okay? I am routing the user. Once this is successful, they've successfully logged in, I route the user over to the index page. Back to the index page. And I use the header command for doing that. Okay, and you remember it's got a key value. Basically you're saying location, that's where I want to go to. New location, this URL. All right, um, so if the credentials were incorrect, if it's not one, it should probably be zero. Sorry, you must enter a valid username and password to log in. Maybe we put a link in for, um, we add a link in for the sign up page, something like that. Okay. So now I've got cookies. So when we log out, we need that logout script to delete the cookies. So we'll use set cookie again, and we will set the time back. This will force the deletion. Now this command, so we got this third parameter in here. And so what we're doing is this sets the time back an hour. Time. This is a Unix command that gives me the seconds since when? I know you know the answer. What? 1970. 1970, the epoch, the birth of Unix. Okay, January 1st, 1970 really wasn't then, but that's, within the, that's the time and day they use. Okay, 
So, Zulu time for January 1st, 1970. My, and then, um, so that's the second since then. Um, minus 3,600 seconds, which is an hour. Okay, so an, so an hour ago. What does this do? This will delete the cookie on the, um, the client side. All right, so let's take a look at the logout script. So, so user selects they want to log out. They check, uh, we're checking to make sure that, do we have a cookie for user ID? Okay, great. Go ahead and set the user ID and the username cookie back an hour. And we're good. Now, yeah, we're good. And then we redirect them back to the index page. Is an hour the default cookie then? No. Uh, if there's no time set on the cookie when the server, when, when the user dismisses the tab or dismisses that session, uh, cookie goes away. Okay, sessions. Many people don't like to use cookies because of security concerns. They like the added security of disabling them. Yes, I do. Okay. I will occasionally, if somebody, if um, if I get a pop up that says, uh, well, first off, who runs AdBlock, by the way? Okay, good. You should run AdBlock. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is the thing that gave cookies a bad name was this company called DoubleClick, which I. You think oh, they're still in business? Yeah, yeah. they are. They're yeah. still yeah. plugging along, still black hats. Horrible, horrible. They're professional hackers. Okay, so um, anyways, I will occasionally disable uh, for a particular site at this particular moment. Okay, you get that option in Firefox or in Chrome or whatever. Um, what I wish that websites would do is in that pop-up that they would send a little link that directs you to a static page with their policy of what cookies they store on your client. And that would make me feel far more comfortable. I think that that would be great if somebody started doing that on a regular basis. Hey, we're open, these are the cookies we store. I could go and look. I mean, it's, it's actually not that difficult for me to go and, you know, it's not anything extra. I, would, I am not shocked if that were a legal requirement in Europe. But it should be a legal, a legal requirement. requirement in America to have a disclosure, but not to have it at the moment that code. And not even have a link. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you're required to have a link to their privacy policy, but their privacy policy does not have to say what That's cookie one. information that they store. So, um, many people don't like to. So yeah, so I might do that. And then what I'll do is when I'm done, I will promptly delete my cache. Okay. I still believe that, well, we get it. Get to this. All right, let's talk about sessions. Sessions are not dependent upon the client. Sessions store information on the server, not the client. Session information expires when the session ends, i.e., the user closes the browser. Okay, so. All of the session information is on the server. So the client cannot get access to that information. So it's protected. All right? It's, it's now under the whatever the policies of that server is, which as a developer, you should know if you're hosting it in the cloud someplace at like site five or I don't know, I can't think of you know, GoDaddy. There's tons of other places. Amazon Web Services. It's incumbent upon you to know what their security policies are. And usually they let you set those to a certain degree, okay? And it's different if you have your own virtual server versus a cloud shared server, because if it's a cloud shared slice, then the policy is across, you know, everybody it's the same. Those are less, they're less expensive, but you know, you just kind of got to be careful of what you run and know what the limitations are. Okay, using sessions with PHP. In PHP, you must indicate when a session starts with session start. And I have a, 
link to that. So you call the function session start in login. And then when you want to end the session, you call session destroy in your logout. Pretty simple. You get a super global for session. Okay, that's used to re retrieve the session variables. All right, so you can echo out, use you know session username right here, and then you can just set whatever these are in here. Okay, you can create whatever variables in session you want. And then once you log out, um, are they deleted? Well, there's always some caveat in web development, isn't there? Session variables are not automatically deleted when the session is destroyed. Okay? To force the removal of all session variables for the current session, do the following. Really? Yes. Okay? So you are dependent upon the client, the user, closing that tab, quitting their web browser. For, you, for the session variables to go away. Okay, now, I'm sure there is some underlying infrastructure re reason, probably having to do with proper tearing down of the TCP connection, blah, 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 whatever. Okay, but really, can I just delete my session variables? All right, so if you want to ensure that your session variables are deleted and not have to rely on the client, then you have to do this. You're, you're zeroing out your session super global by doing this. All right, here's the thing about sessions. They are short-lived. In other words, they only last as long as the current browser session is open. <coughs> okay? So then your book says, well, what if you want it to be open longer? Um, because what are the advantages of cookies? They have a longer time to live. You can set the time to live you can use that sort of to your advantage. So an example might be, you know, the example, here's the example the book uses. I don't want the user to have to always log in all the time, right? Well, I think that's ridiculous. I think we should require people to log in all the time, okay? I know that I could be in session and logged into um, PeopleSoft, you know, for, ready to post you guys as grades or something for your transcripts. And if I'm like not doing anything for 10 minutes, poof, I'm, I'm out, I'm gone. Okay, inactivity, you're done, All right? And Blackboard occasionally logs you out, right? Okay, so yeah, not only do, you know, they wait for 10 minutes of inactivity, okay. So uh, maybe, maybe you're working on your laptop, you're at work, and you're in the, well, here, I'll use this example. You're, you're at home working on your taxes, and you're using Quicken in the cloud, and you're on four, four, you know, the 312th form that you have to fill out to get your taxes done, and you've got 500. You want to be able to find your way back to where you were. So you'd like the state of what you're doing preserved. You could use a cookie to preserve the state, okay? Where was I at? You could do that. All right. I still think there's better ways. Um, so if the browser allows cookies, a session may set a cookie that temporarily stores the session ID. This, I argue, is the only thing you should store in a cookie, is the session ID and use that to extend out the link. Okay, you access the session ID by using the function session name. I have a link to that. So in order to fully close a session, you must delete any cookies that were created to store the session ID. So um, in my logout, I'd have to say um, set cookie session name, and I could just give it a blank value all right, so I'm zeroing out the value here and then set it back an hour. All right, here's a kinder way for me to rant. The Head First PHP book um, talks about mixing sessions and cookies so as not to inconvenience users. 
inconvenient, quote unquote, inconvenience users. So they don't have to re-log in every time they close the browser, boo-hoo. So you have to weigh, here's the thing, you have to weigh as a developer, as a company who's representing, you know, you're writing bank software, I don't know, okay? You have to weigh the importance of convenience versus security, even if your users don't, all right? Remember, if you are a target employee and you're a developer, you're the, you're the company they're going to sue because you let all the credit card data out, okay? Not, you know, you're the, you're the one, <laughs> okay? So not you individually, but target's held accountable for that, okay? They are still, they're paying, they figure it's going to be over a billion dollars for that. <laughs> they are basically paying the fees, the $1,000, um, you know, financial watch fees for everybody for like 10 years. <laughs> okay. What? I wouldn't be shocked. Okay. So you have to weigh the important, I would not be shocked. Um, you have to, I do know how it was done by the way. So you have to weigh the importance of convenience versus security, even if your users don't. You could create an application that takes advantage of both sessions and cookies. However, if there is any sensitive information you are working with, you must be careful what information you are storing in cookies. All right. Um, so let's just say, I, I would actually update that and say there's absolutely no reason you, can, you can't develop a web application that doesn't use cookies at all. Okay. If I wanted to preserve, let's say, what, what tax form you're on right now, and you close your lid, you close your browser, and then you go and log back in, okay, of course, you to log back in, and uh, I want it to come back up. If I want to preserve the state of where you were in your web application, without using a cookie, how could I do it? You guys already know the answer to this. Save the workflow in your database. Save the workflow in your database. Okay? So, but people, but then people say, well, I have to store that on my, on my database. Well, first off, it's not a lot of information. Secondly, isn't that worth the liability of getting sued for letting people's data out? Okay? Or something worse happening? People, you know, another avenue to hack into your system? Okay, so there is no reason to store cookies at all. You can store all of that in a table, in an extra table in a database and link that in on what state I'm at in my application. Okay, last state. Every time they go to a new page, you write the state where they're at. That's what databases are for. Okay? All right. So the last part, uh, seven and a half, chapter seven and a half, talks about eliminating duplicate code by using templates. So, okay, and really all that is, it's, it's templating, is the common things being done on other pages are put in their own script. It's the principle of DR, uh, DRY, don't repeat yourself. If you find yourself repeating yourself, find that you're writing code over and over again, like, by golly, this header information is exactly the same with the exception of the name of the page for every single page. Maybe I should create a script called header.php and have a variable for the page that changes, right? Or same with the footer or same with the nav menu. And so um, if you were to download the final part of, what is it, chapter seven or seven and a half or whatever? Did I forget? Oh, here it is, 7.5. 7 so, um, so like here, in index, every, you know, the index page has a header, <coughs> it has a nav menu, and at the bottom it has a footer, okay? Edit profile. I've got a header, somewhere down here I've got the nav menu, and I've got a footer, et cetera, et cetera. So here's my header. And it's identical with the exception that I have a page title. And if I look at uh, like line six right here, I just set the page title variable to something different. 
okay? And then I include the header. <laughs> so one of the first things I do, I change the page title variable. Now I'm including the header. So when the header runs, hey, the page title will, you know, now it's whatever that, what is it? it says where opposites attract, okay, whatever. Okay, and then the edit profile would be, uh, where are you, uh, edit profile, okay? So, yep, and then the footer, that's down here somewhere. Uh, here's the nav menu. Okay, the nav menu puts your, who's if you're logged in, log out and whatever your name is from the session variable, okay? So that's all templating is. All right, let's see. One last thing. Okay, so so that's it for the lecture notes, but before we take a break, I'd like to walk through project two with you, which was Xena inspired this. So if you don't like this project, you can blame Xena for it being too hard. By the way, be kind to Xena because Xena is six years old today. I promised her I was going to embarrass her. Did I do a good job? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, did anybody hear the rumor on what the last project was? The rumor mill game? It was really easy. So, Xena comes to me and says, that project was way too easy, right? But you didn't even take that class. You heard it from other students you were helping. I watched. I checked them off. You did check them off. That's right. She was checking them off, and she comes and she says, "This is too easy." Go, I know, I know. She's cutting them a break. It's too easy. Okay. All right. So then she gives me this project that was too hard. <laughs> okay. So we kind of hit a compromise, I think. All right. So here's the problem. You often need to calculate values based on a formula that's going to differ based on various inputs. So, um, for example, to get a rough calculation of the number of calories that you burn while exercising, it would require knowing your heart rate and knowing how long you're exercising. In addition, that calculation, this is a rough calculation. If you really wanted to know exactly how much, you'd have to calculate uh, whatever your, your oxygen production, no, oxygen, consumption and your CO2 production, which is this thing called VO2 max, which is actually a painful thing to do, okay? And, um, and then you get a good idea. And you have to redo it like every couple of years anyways because your metabolism changes, you get older and things mm -hmm. like that. All right, but generally it's different depending upon your gender. So um, you are going to create a program that logs your exercise activity and calculates the number of calories burned. Here is the formula. There is a formula for male and a formula for female. Okay? And so for these H, R, W, A, and T, H, R is heart rate in beats per minute. W is weight in pounds, A is age in years, and T is exercise duration time in minutes. Okay, so if you want to see where that formula came from and read up some more, here's a link. Here are the minimum requirements. You must have an edit profile page for entering your first name, your last name, your gender, birth date, weight in pounds, a button to save the profile. Okay. Your edit profile must have access restriction. That's all I'm saying. Do some kind of access restriction. Okay. You must have a log exercise page for entering the type of exercise. You should have at least four exercises to choose from. Here are some examples. Yeah, other can be an example. All right. The date of the exercise. The time in minutes, the average heart rate. You will need a button to log the exercise. When pressing this button, the program must calculate the calories you burned and display the number of calories burned on this page and log the exercise, including calories burned, to the database. You must have a view profile page that will display your first name, last name, gender, birth date, weight, and pounds. 
the view profile page must also display a table in table form, a t HTML table, with the latest exercise entries up to the last 15. Hey, you might have to look up how to paginate. Okay, that is in the chapter of your book that deals with, what is it, risky jobs. I can't even remember what chapter that is. I don't know. It's, what is it? Yes. That'll do it automatically for you. Don't even do it. That's right. You may. You're right. Okay. You are going to display those newest to oldest. Each entry displayed will list the following. The date of the exercise. The type of exercise. The time in minutes that you exercised. The average heart rate. The calories burned. Each entry must contain a link to remove it from the database. Okay? You must have a database with an exercise log table that contains the following fields. An ID set as the primary key. User ID for linking the exercise user table. Okay, more about that in a bit. The date. The type of exercise. Time in minutes. Heart rate. Okay, your database will also have an exercise user table that contains the following fields an ID set as the primary key, the first name, the last name, the gender, the birth date, the weight. Note, creating a separate table for users is more useful if you were to create a login system for multiple users. See extra credit below. Okay. All field entries must be validated. All field entries must be sticky. except for password. Don't make that one sticky. Okay. Um, extra credit. You get, okay, so it's 20 points. You get five extra credit points if you add the ability to have multiple users. Hey, maybe kind of like mismatch. Okay. This will require you to add a password column to the exercise user table. Might want to hash that. Okay. Hey, sample output, because, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Your edit profile page might look something like this, and that's using Twitter Bootstrap. Thank you, Zena. You're not. Yeah, you were. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah. Oh, you were using something like it. Yeah. What was it? Okay. It looks like Bootstrap. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. You can do the same thing with Bootstrap. Um, I like this one. All right, note, it is not required to choose and save a picture. Your log exercise page might look something like this. Okay? Um, yeah. Now, if you use some other third-party thing like Bootstrap, when you click on the date thing, you get, if you use their date widget, you get like it shows up with current today's date and that's really easy or you could just have a hand entry thing where you make people enter in the date you know whatever uh, your exercise types might look something like this okay your view profile I'm sorry yeah view profile page might look something like this okay so you have here's the view profile again the picture is optional and then you have the latest up to the latest 15 log entries and a little delete thing here you don't have to use an icon it could just be a link whatever but if you use bootstrap you've got little icons that you can choose from that look like trash cans okay constraints ensure your program takes only numeric data validate all fields make sure all field entries are sticky except for password uh, here's a link to some math function some PHP math functions okay You'll probably need some of those. Credit. Yes, this was suggested by Zena Schrader, who rightly mentioned that this would be much more practical web application assignment than just calculating BMI. Thumbs up to you. So I had this as the animated GIF from Who Saw Star Wars? Okay, was that like, that was my favorite scene where BB-8 gives the thumbs up with the lighter, the 1980s reference. I had that. I got that. I put that in. My website doesn't support it. Damn it. 
Okay, here are your directions. Rubric hasn't changed. Here's your submission instructions. Any questions about project two? Um, clarification on program only takes numeric values. <clears throat> except for your except for your name. Like the profile information can all be appropriate types. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A numeric date, yeah, make sure that the numeric data is numeric. So your first name and your last name is pretty much the only alpha numeric character stuff. Okay? Yes. So what do we do to tick off Xena? <laughs> oh, I'm glad we're not doing You that have nothing to do site. with it. <laughs> I'm um, glad we're not doing another BMI script. The BMI, yeah. Who's had BMI problems for, not BMI. Who's had, <laughs> that didn't come out right, did it? I'm so sorry. <laughs> did I say that? Did I really say that? Um, so uh, yeah, who's, who's, who's been assigned an algorithm to work out BMI? Okay, in other classes? Okay, yay, another good reason not to do it. Okay, if we go to, what's that? Portfolio project? Is it really? Yeah. It would be a better one than the other Yeah. This one? Yeah. But is this, do, do you think this is an appropriate project too? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very appropriate. No, no you don't think it's an appropriate project too. Okay. Yeah. I think so too. You, honestly, this is, what is this, Cena? This is what? Mismatch? Yeah. This is mismatch. Okay. You got it written for you. This is mis mismatch. mismatch with math. This is mismatch with math and the math I gave you. I gave you the math. I mean, you could even do the whole user thing. Okay. All right. Uh, oh, I was looking for something. Course <coughs> syllabus. The due date for project two. Yeah. Okay. So remember, next week is the exam. The following week is what? Are you guys coming here the following week? No, because it's spring break. You could come here, but I won't be here. All right. So... So week nine, I don't even know what day that is. That's when your project two is due. So that gives you, let's see, this is week seven. So we got one week, two weeks. You got, is that three weeks? Am I guessing right? You got three weeks to do this project? Yeah. That's a lot of notice. Okay. Unless you're traveling one of the weeks. Take your laptop with you. Yeah. Well, you don't even need your laptop. Just have a computer.